Good morning. <clears throat> it, it's a pleasure to speak to my cohort. <laughs> that at noon today, I'll sp be speaking to another group that on the average will be 50 years younger <laughs> than, than this. Uh, both will be fun, I'm sure. Now, one needs to be wary of any history told by a participant. <laughs> and as you know, even before the age of alternate facts, the, the, way, the way we view something is always very personalized. But I've, I've told this story before to groups that also participate in the development of Hubble. I think it stands up. Any story should begin at the beginning. And if you want to have a telescope, an observatory in space, you have to get it there, which means not just lobbing it up, but putting it out of the Earth's atmosphere and traveling at some 15,000 miles an hour. This requires rockets. And modern rocketry really started with this person in the white coat here, or, or the dark coat, Hermann Oberth, who started developing rockets in Germany in the 1920s, late 1920s, at a time because of the Versailles Treaty, Germany not, was not allowed to have long-range artillery any longer. Remember the, we don't remember the Paris guns that could uh, hit Paris from uh, artillery that could hit Paris from 50 miles away. They couldn't have those anymore. They do, started to develop for the first time real rockets. Oberth was the head of this program. This picture was taken in 1928 and looked like a modern rocket. Actually, the only rocket that worked at the time was the one the technician is holding <laughs> here. Now, things progress rapidly. Now, I like this picture because you see this knobchen over here, this young man. In, in the, with the knickers on. Anyone recognize him? Werner von, von Braun. Who, of course, after, by the time he was 24, had an equivalent of a PhD in engineering and also had Oberth's job. Oberth was a difficult person. He went back to Transylvania uh, Werner took over, and of course, what in his early career, what he's most famous for was the development of the V-2 rocket, the Aufwitter, uh rocket of the, the German program. Thousands were built, and at the end of the war, a large number of them had been captured and brought, along with the people who built them, to, to the US. Many of those were then used by scientists who were just presented out of the blue. The ability to go above the atmosphere and observe the universe in the complete range of colors that the universe is talking to us, whereas here on the ground we can only hear one of its languages, that is the, the visible light that makes it through the atmosphere. Now, things progressed. The, the Soviets launched, uh, launched uh, Sputnik. We rapidly caught up with that. One of the first astronomical images made from space was made during the uh, Gemini program. Gemini, you probably remember, the program where they, they followed Mercury, which was one astronaut. Gemini had two, and part, <coughs> part of the uh, program was to do these spacewalks, which was really just 
opening the hatch and going out on, on tethers. But during one of these open hatch times, they set a camera out on the edge of the, the uh, spacecraft and took a picture of the sky. And like often happens, one of the first images in space was of the Orion constellation here. This is the belt, the soar. And the stars look <coughs> different from what we see with our eye, because now you could start to see the high energy light being emitted that would otherwise not make through the atmosphere. So this was the int introduction to imaging in space. Now, at a time immediately after World War II, when these V-2 Army surplus V-2 rockets had uh, begun to be used in the United States, a young scientist then at Yale University by the name of Lyman Spitzer was asked for the, by the Rand Corporation to lay out what could be done if one had regular access to space and the ability to, to uh, build astronomical satellites, build observatories, short-lived, long-lived observatories in space. Lyman Spitzer identified a series of steps that could be made, but with an ultimate goal of building something like today's Hubble Space Telescope. That is, a large telescope is about as large as the largest ground-based telescopes at that time, and used by astronomers from the ground. That Lyman, at the time, was like 30, and stayed with this idea for many years, and he became identified with the program. He was the advocate of something like Hubble for, for decades, even before there was the ability to, for Americans to go into space. I'm happy to say I came to know him well. I knew him, of course, as a famous scientist. Um, <coughs> as a young uh, uh, scientist myself, and he was a very established figure, I got to know him best personally when we were on a, a two-week climbing trip in British Columbia. And this is my favorite picture of Lyman, uh, taken on the summit ridge uh, of Mount Bertram Petrie, uh, a peak we were able to name uh, afterwards because it was unnamed. And in Canada, the people who do the first ascent were uh, able to suggest a name for Forest. Bertram Peter is a famous Canadian astronomer. So this is my favorite picture of, of Lyman. Uh, looking back on it, he was uh, about 55 at, at, at the time. So he was really the father of the idea of the Hubble Space uh, Telescope. Now, the, my involvement started in 1971. At the time, I was a, a professor at the uh, University of Chicago and brought in as an advisor uh, to NASA, along with half a dozen other, uh, basically, observatory directors. Uh, I was the kid of the the group, because in 71 I would have been 34, that we looked at many designs, and there were multiple contractors vying for the rights, the contract, to build the Hubble Space Telescope. And it was ill-defined how you would actually do it and what form it would take. And so, 
we would advise what the scientific goals were, and if these engineering ideas that they were coming up with would actually achieve what we wanted to see done. This was an early design. It's interesting in that you see that all of the scientific instruments, there are multiple scientific instruments here, were together as one big assembly. Now, any telescope on the ground has multiple instruments. Some of them are imaging, they're basically cameras. Others are spectrometers, things that break up the light of the stars, the nebulae, into its component colors. And so on the ground, what you do is during the day, you change out the scientific instrument, and then at night you observe. We wouldn't have that option. <coughs> so the multiple instruments all had to be the, up there at once. And in this early concept, <coughs> the, the idea was that would be that astronauts would occasionally visit the thing and do things like replace film on it. Now this was all done at a time when there were no television type detectors that were of sufficient quality for research purposes. And how you did this and how you afforded to send astronauts up frequently was unclear because at that time, 1971, the shuttle was still something, an idea that was on the drawing board. The, the basic elements of it, the telescope was there though. Here was the primary mirror. Light would come in from this side, be collected, reflected up here, and then the magnifying secondary mirror here would bounce the image back to its focus back here where the scientific instruments would be located. The power for this satellite would come from solar arrays. The same things that are the same principle of things that are becoming popular as an alternative fuel source or energy source today. And you had to move the telescope around to be pointed at different parts of the sky. And this was done by things called uh, reaction wheels. And they're depicted here, which are really just big electrical motors, except the rotor of them is massive. It's about 40 pounds. And according to New Newton's laws of motion, if you spin this 40 pound wheel in one direction, the spacecraft to which it is attached would move in the opposite direction more slowly because it would weigh about 25,000 pounds. So things like that, the, the tape recorders that were there to re, uh, record the data, the film canisters, all of that was packaged back here. That was one concept. That was developed by the Goddard Space Flight Center, which is up near the uh, Washington, D.C. Very famous center, most of scientific uh, work in, in NASA is, is headquartered there. Another concept was developed at the Marshall Space Flight Center, Huntsville, Alabama, 
who is also vying <coughs> for the leadership role in the Hubble project. Here is their concept, look very similar to the previous one, except now they put in the shuttle. Because it was something that Marshall was part of uh, wanting to build, and it would allow coming to the, the, uh, the Hubble frequently. So it was an integral part of the, uh, the plan. Of course, we always kept, they always kept the, the Titan launch vehicle as the alternative because the Titan existed. It was an ICBM, and it existed, and the shuttle was just an idea. That through this series of studies, they finally uh, narrowed down the general concept of what it would be, and wanted to move into the, uh, an actual preliminary design phase. And at that time, the Marshall Space Flight Center was designated as the lead center for the uh, development of the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, I mentioned that I have been a director of the observatory, the chair of the department, and a full professor at Chicago, which was a pretty sweet job. Uh, and especially since I, I've had it since I was 29. And uh, I was asked in 1972 to come down to Marshall to head up the science of the Hubble Space Telescope program. Now, why would I possibly want to leave such a sweet job to gamble on m moving to Huntspatch, Alabama. <laughs> People of our age understand that joke. <laughs> May Al Cap rest in peace. The, which was not funded, even funded at the time. It was just being studied. And the reasons for taking that gamble are illustrated here. This gives the effective resolution of a telescope in a unit called seconds of arc, which are one, <coughs> one, about one three thousandths of the diameter of the, the moon. So that a smaller number is better. The hum, human eye has a resolution of about a hundred of these seconds of arc that they're, they're called. So that from time immemorial, the human eye had been able to see at about this level of effectiveness. <coughs> that I plot against this measure of, of the quality of the image, time. So historical times, the human, human eye could see here. But with Galileo's application of the Dutch invention of the telescope, all of a sudden, one could see the, the sky with 10 times greater clarity. Then over, so that was some 400 years ago. All of a sudden, we could see 10 times better. Now, with time, the quality of telescopes became better and better, but not all that much better, not like that initial step of the first telescope. And the reason it flattened out is no matter how good a ground-based telescope was, the ability to see things clearly was defined by the Earth's atmosphere. 
Not only does the Earth's atmosphere block out most of the colors of light that reach the Earth, but it blurs the images that we receive from space. So you could build even better, tel bigger telescopes from the ground at that time, but it wouldn't allow you to see anything more clearly. But with the Hubble Space Telescope, almost as big as the largest telescopes of the time, being above the atmosphere, you were not you didn't have this blurring layer of, of material above you. And you could see an image that was determined by the quality of the telescope, quality and size of the telescope, and not by the atmosphere. So that <coughs> we, would, we projected that we would be able to see, make as great a leap in the ability to see the universe as had been achieved by Galileo 400 years ago. <coughs> that, was, that was worth gambling on. <coughs> the, the design developed over the next several years by the Marshall team uh, ended up looking like this. Again, it had the features of the solar arrays supplying electrical power, the primary mirror here, the magnifying mirror there. <coughs> now, the scientific instruments were all designed to be in boxes, each one about as big as a old telephone booth. <coughs> the, and also, and that's harder to see in this figure, that the heavy things in the equipment had all been moved to a ring around the middle of the primary mirror. And that design of shifting those heavy pieces to there allowed one to simplify the pointing system. But it also meant <coughs> the size of the telescope so that it could still fit in the payload bay of the Space shuttle. <coughs> the, not a great compromise in performance, but a certain compromise. But it allowed us to be able to afford to build the thing. So this was the final design. Now, the mirror for the observatory was built out on the East Coast, a company then called Perkin Elmer Corporation, an experienced company in building optics, precision optics, including precision optics for space. Because from the beginning, the United States has had two space programs, one highly visible, NASA, the other military reconnaissance. Not at all visible. We don't see the budget. We taxpayers. Uh, completely in parallel. And they were building mirrors for reconnaissance satellites. After the mirror was completed out in Denver, uh, Connecticut, it was loaded into this modified Electra airliner put into here. It was called the uh, Super Guppy. Transported <coughs> <coughs> out to the West Coast to the Lockheed Missile Spacecraft Corporation, 
with response near Sunnyvale or in Sunnyvale, California, just south of San Francisco. Lockheed had responsibility for the overall observatory. There, the telescope was assembled. Beautiful piece of equipment, about as long as the width of this, this room. And, of course, the shiny exterior were insulating layers, not structural, to control the temperature on the inside of it. Here's one of my favorite pictures where they're moving the Hubble from its assembly room into a room where it would, would be shaken, get vibration tested. The shuttle is a very hostile environment in the payload bay because the, it was an aircraft, it's not aerodynamically smooth. And when the engines were firing, lots of vibration. So you had to over-engineer everything in it. But you also had to test it, that it would survive the shaking environment of the shuttle. So it was being moved in such a room. <coughs> they, it'll only last till the blossoms disappear. <laughs> uh, I like the way it was moved. So you see these people moving it. Norwegian steam. <laughs> no machines. And they could do it because it was actually floating on air cushions. These are great fans blowing air against the floor. So the spacecraft is actually floating on air. It only took one person to move it. The other people here and on the other side were making sure it didn't move into the wrong place. They, that would have been an expensive mistake. So the preliminary design moved into an actual design, which moved into the construction. <clears throat> Headquartered at Lockheed in the Bay Area. Individual scientific instruments were being developed under the leadership of scientists located around the United States. Here was the workhorse. Here is the workhorse camera, called the so-called wide field planetary camera, that was actually uh, built in Boulder, Colorado by the uh, then Ball Aerospace Company, Ball Brothers. And significant instrument, weighed about 400 pounds on the Earth, of course, weighed nothing in space, and ended up costing as much as the original projection for the whole observatory. And I, I, I say that, I point that out because we we're building something that had never been done before. And you really didn't know at the beginning just how much it was going to cost to build. It's, it's like building a house and you tell the contractor who signs their name on it to, to build a particular thing. Then you decide, well, you don't, really don't want that wall there. Sure, we'll move the wall, even though you haven't built it yet. We'll move the wall over the here, but there's an add-on cost, because they'll give all kinds of reasons why it costs more to do it that way. And 
when you're actually into the construction phase, if you say, down to the end, you know, I really don't like that color paint. Redo it. Of course. <coughs> so that's what we saw a whole lot of. And that was normal in building uh, things in space because all of it was new. There wasn't you weren't just doing what had been done before. There weren't uh, good ideas of what it would cost. But one of the things that was most interesting and different, certainly unique, was the spacecraft was being designed to be serviced in orbit. Up until then, it had never been done before. There had been spacewalks, of course. There was a program of the American Space Station called the Skylab, <coughs> where people live inside an environment and operated instruments and repaired them, but not an idea where you had a remote spacecraft that you'd go back and repair and improve. So these instruments that were now reduced to box, being put in boxes in order to be changed, so you could change them out in orbit, had to be able to interact with crew, that is people. So that here's a picture of one of the engineering runs we had at Marshall. In a, something called the neutral buoyancy simulator, which was a, a tank of water about the size of this room and <clears throat> probably about 10 feet higher than this room. So an astronaut in a space scoop that was properly uh, weighted could feel like they were in zero gravity. And so we would try different designs of the boxes that contain the scientific instruments to make sure it would work efficiently with the astronauts. So, so here's a picture of one of the main scientific instruments being replaced. And here are two astronauts, uh, Bruce McCandless, Kathy uh, Sullivan here, and it looked a whole lot like space except you can see bubbles coming up out of their spacesuits, and you can see an anonymous observer <laughs> who had hair at that time uh, <laughs> observing the whole process. So this was all part of the design, that was all new about it, because this idea of interacting with astronauts over a long period of time. Now we had <coughs> at least our share of difficulty. And these are kind of summarized in this figure. This time, I'm plotting the months that we anticipated until launch, going up to six years here, seven years here versus time. So when we actually entered the final design and construction phase, it was anticipated that we would launch some 75 months later in late 1983. Well, as the complexity of the program became more obvious, the schedule began to slip, cost, identifiable cost was increasing <coughs> till a crisis was finally reached. Are you going to stop building it and kiss off the money you spent already? Or are you going to bite the bullet, refinance it, 
come up with a new schedule. And of course, you had to find a guilty party. <laughs> and so a new project manager was found and assigned here. So you had a new budget, a new schedule, and a new manager. Well, things progressed. Time went on. Cost estimated total to complete kept going up. It kept falling behind that schedule, established schedule. Again, soul searching, desk pounding, <laughs> new, more money, new schedule, new project manager. And we were to the point that by January of 1986, the schedule still, with the final tweak, still called for a launch late in 1986. But January of 86 was the Challenger accident, at which time the, we didn't know when we could launch because the availability of the shuttle was very uncertain. So it, no shuttles flew for a while. But during this period, of course, all of the spacecraft that had been in, wanting to be launched right away were held back. So everyone was jockeying for position. So that accounted for the multiple changes in the schedule that occurred over the next several years until finally launch occurred in April of 1990. We were fortunate that we had an excellent crew. Lauren Shriver was the, a pilot's pilot, that is a former military Air Force pilot, the kind of person you want to be, fly, want to be flying up front on your, your airliner. Lots of experience, good head. The co-pilot was Charlie Bolden. Charlie was, uh, I guess, making his second flight as co-pilot. Since this time, Lauren, who was older, has retired as an astronaut. Charlie has retired as an astronaut and is now the head of the NASA. NASA. He is the administrator of, of NASA and a good one. The, of course, he will be changed out as soon as the government comes or gets around to making appointments. The, uh, <laughs> you know, the normal thing is the administrator is changed uh, the next week after uh, inauguration. The, there was an astronomer on board, Steve Hawley. I've known Steve for a long time because he and I had the same thesis advisor way back when. He was some 20 years younger though. Bruce McCandless, a Navy, uh, he was captain uh, at that time, his rank, which of course is the, the uh, equivalent of a, a uh, full colonel in uh, the Air Force and, and the Army. Bruce is most famous. You've seen these pictures of astronauts floating out in space on a backpack. He was the lead engineer on that. He was the person out there. And the other crew member was Kathy Sullivan, trained as a geologist. 
became an uh, astro very successful astronaut. She ended up flying like five times. And uh, she has just re retired uh, from the government where she was the uh, head of the National Oceanic Air uh, and Atmospheric uh, Agency of the, the government. She had, it was a planned retirement on, on her part. And in fact, it's interesting because she's now writing a book, preparing a book on the history of development of tools to be used in space. After the launch occurred, the Hubble was left in orbit. The shuttle came back. Now, one of our scientists would like to bring cartoons like this far side one uh, to each meeting. And he would say, you know, those last months, you know, this is really tough, but wait till we break out. So these prisoners, each one is labeled with one of the pre-launch tests, here, are just about to break out. And those who can't read it, we're almost free, everyone. I just felt the first drop of rain. Well, that was so funny at the time. <laughs> because the world knows, and your laughter indicates you know, that there was a problem with the primary mirror. It's called spherical aberration for simplicity. It was discovered right after the first images. The cause a misaligned optical device used to measure the shape of the primary mirror. And this device was just based on the same principle optics have been made for hundreds of years. That it, when you look through the test device, device, the mirror, when it was the right shape, would look flat. But the device had been made put together incorrectly. And the test device is shown here. It's something you, you look through it at the primary mirror, and as I say, it should look flat. But the pieces of optics in the test device had to be aligned very precisely with respect to one another. And this meant measuring the end, determining the end of a rod that was used for referring the position of all of the instruments or optical elements. So ideally, when you look through there at the shiny tip, you knew just where it was. But in order to make sure your measuring device, it wasn't an eye, was looking at the, the top of the device, a little cap, brass cap, was put on with a hole in it. Now the instructions were make the brass cap, drill the hole in the metal, paint it flat black. So that when you look through, the shiny part you saw was the end of that rod. What was done, they made the, the cap, painted it, then drilled the hole. And when that happened, a piece of paint chipped off on the edge. So the brightest signal came from there, not down there. So everything was off by 1.3 millimeters. Fortunately, in the ensuing uh, investigation, went back, found the test device, which had never been touched since it, that use, and could determine exactly what had gone wrong. And therefore, you knew that if you had put in new scientific instruments, that if you simply changed the prescription and the relay optics inside them, it could make up for this the error in the shape of the mirror. And that's what was done. At that time, 
primary mirror is not considered the most demanding part of the Hubble because there have been reconnaissance satellites built for years. Method of testing had become routine. Management was concerned with other things, something called the fine guidance sensor, which was new. And the resident quality assurance man at the optical shop or plant had not been changed out. Normally, you do that every year, but that person had to have a top secret clearance. And they don't give those out with cereal in the morning. So he was left in there year after year. He had been drinking coffee with uh, the people he was supervising or questioning for years. His kids had been playing soccer with their kids. And so when they reported an anomaly in the alignment of that test device, they said, told him, it's not a problem. He put the report in a desk drawer and didn't forward it to us. But because the Hubble had been built to be serviced, there have been the multiple servicing missions by the shuttle. The first one corrected all of the problems with the shape of the primary mirror. And each, each servicing mission, you put in new instruments, new components from the spacecraft, like the original information recording devices were tape recorded. Now they're solid state things. The electronics have all been, and the computers have all been changed out. All, all the instruments have been changed out, in many cases, multiple times. So at this time, the Hubble is more powerful than it's ever been. So here's an actual picture from one of those servicing missions of that one of the scientific instruments being changed out. See how similar it is to that water simulation that I showed before. One of the first targets, again, was Orion. Here in the picture of the constellation, here's the nebula down there. There's a mosaic of some 104 uh, Hubble images. Down in the core of that is a mosaic of uh, some 16 different pointings that I actually made in the the early days, and it was interesting in those, so this is like 95, those first images on Orion discovered a new class of objects called protoplanetary disk, where you could actually see the halo of gas around a newly formed star. And you could see this disk of dust and gas there, which would become the, the, the planetary system of that star. And it all de what it looked like all depended on the angle of it. So here's one that you see at a more oblique angle. So lots of discoveries, right? And these discoveries allowed us to actually build a three-dimensional model of the, the Orion Nebula. And here, so then you can take that model and <coughs> feed it into a computer and simulate like you're there and flying around inside the nebula. So this is not a cartoon, but actually uh, a three-dimensional model that we had built in a computer, and then you're doing the simulated fly around uh, of this region. And this is all enabled by the Hubble Space Telescope, and also, of course, making the right kind of observations with it, 
and knowing the physics that is controlling the situation. So things like that are fun. <laughs> Another fun thing has been the so-called Hubble Deep Field. Now, I don't know well how well you can see this from the back. I wish we could reduce the lights for this one. <coughs> The Hubble Deep Field was an unusual program because the whole idea was to find a place in space where there wasn't anything. That is, that there weren't any bright stars or nebulae there. So that you could look out from the crowded field of stars in our galaxy, so you could look in between the stars to have the best possible view of deep space, hence the name Hubble Deep Field. And then the same spot was imaged again over and over and over, orbit after orbit, for some uh, 10 days in all, and building up a better and better quality image. And of course, what you see when you do that, well, there is the odd star here off on the edge, another one up here, but every one of these other objects there is a galaxy like our own. So that now we're looking out far enough into to space that we're seeing basically only galaxies. And the, as a rule of thumb, the brighter ones and the larger ones that we see here are the nearer ones. Now, a telescope like this is a time machine. When we look at the sun, we're actually seeing what the sun was like eight minutes ago, because it has taken light at the incredible speed of 186 miles a, a, a second. It's still taken eight minutes for the light of the sun to reach the Earth. We're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. When we look at an image of uh, Uranus or Neptune or Pluto far out in the solar system, we're seeing those planets and uh, minor planets as they were hours, you know, almost an hour ago. When we look at the nearest star, we see it like it was a year ago because it takes a year of light to reach, reaches. Now, the nearest galaxy we're seeing, what was like a million years ago. So as you sit, look at objects more distant, you're actually looking back in time. So it's a, it is, a telescope is a time machine. So we're looking back in time to what the universe was like <coughs> before the present. So the more, the fainter, smaller objects in here are <coughs> younger. They're not the same age as the nearer, brighter objects. And we've tried to capture this in this simulation where they've taken the actual Hubble deep field image, determined the distances of each of the galaxies in the central part, and now we're flying out into it, which really means we're flying back in time. And one thing you'll notice is that these objects further away and therefore seen as they were early in the 
age of the universe, that the objects are fuzzier. And it's not because we don't see them as well, but because the galaxies had not, were not old enough to have formed themselves completely. Well, the Hubble continues to operate uh, because there are no more servicing missions. It will fail someday. Right now, it's actually performing better because of the updates than it ever has in the past. And we have funding for another three years. I expect they'll continue to be funded uh, as long as it's operating. And right now, we just can't say when that will, will be. It's, it's going to happen. It's going to die sometime. But best expectation uh, prediction is about five years from now. So the level of funding right now is about $100 million uh, a year. I hope you think you're getting your money's worth. This is a measure of a scientific productivity. The number of research papers, refereed papers, published per year. And you see, it is still the most productive scientific uh, facility in the world. If you want reading material, I list several here. One part being The book published more than a decade ago, one chapter on it. Uh, big seller, seller, I just got my uh, yearly uh, statement from Harvard University Press at $24.27 last year. <laughs> Actually, an uh, updated, improved version uh, has been uh, published since then. It is in Japanese. Uh, <laughs> This is a good summary about the people who built it. And I believe next week, on May 8th, the National Geographic Channel is publishing a series, uh, or broadcasting a series of new programs on uh, heart, doing the engineering of space. And there is an episode on the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, I'm a little anxious on how it, it turns out. Uh, I, I helped them de uh, do it, but it, it was obvious I did, had no control over the, the plot. So don't you just love a story with a happy ending? <laughs> Thank you. Are you going to moderate? Oh, OK. I, I will be happy between coughs to uh, answer any questions. Is, is there a traveling mic? That's, that's very important, because it's important that other people. Based on all the research that's come out over the years, can you give us an example of some of the practical things that have developed that are important to people on Earth? I mean, navigation, satellite imagery, that kind of thing? I believe Bob's question was, is there any uh, practical outcome from this, this whole program. Uh, of course, you smile when you say it because all of our, I believe that all of our lives are enriched by having explored Congress of the universe. The, I can't say a, a lot uh, has because we drew on existing technology as much as possible. Now, it's a strange thing in technology that at the time, for example, we started out thinking about 
and we push to have electronic detectors that we employed, identified early, something called the charge couple device as a detector that was really good for us. It's what we needed. The, the, the charge couple devices are what we use today in the Hubble. Do you have a digital camera? That's a charge couple device. That is simply a camera that is an outgrowth of the Hubble program. Now, your life better, my life is better for the convenience of having those on our cell phones. Those are CCDs, and they're the same detector. Probably, that technology would have been developed because of the great commercial market that was there. You know, potentially there. But would it have occurred at that, that same time? No. Would it have occurred within five years? Certainly. So a lot of the things in there were like that. That things like the gyroscopes that we use for the precise, maintaining the precise pointing of it, those were developed or improved for the Hubble program. Those are the same things that are used for on uh, ICBMs that are sitting in missile silos. And I hope they're never used, but that's a technology that the military has been able to, to use so that you can hit a target very precisely with one rather than having to send multiple missiles there to wipe it out. So th those are two very different uh, benefits that we've received from Hubble. But I think, and I feel the justification and has primarily been one of all, you know, our lives are better for because we know things like that, these new things. Good question, Bob. Please stand up. Is there a plan by any other country to go beyond Hubble? Pardon me? Is there a plan by any country or any other space agency to go beyond Hubble? Her question was, what next? Uh, what next is something called the James Webb Space Telescope. It is scheduled for launch in September or October of next year. It, it is much bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope. It is, it is designed to look at longer, softer ener, uh, images rather than the high energy images in the ultraviolet that Hubble deals with. And that allows studying reasons like star formation because of the redshift of the expanding universe. The light of distant galaxies is primarily <coughs> at very red wavelengths that the Hubble cannot carry, uh, detect. So that this James Webb Space Telescope will is something that is the next successor. It, it, not only is the telescope big, it's made of segments, each about this big, and there are some 16 of them put together that are, will be aligned in space. And then there's an enormous sun shield to keep the solar radiation off of it, and that sun shield's about as big as this, this room. It's all packaged in something the size of a couple of Rick's tables. Uh, over there, they've practiced its deployment many times. It's in movies, though. I certainly hope it works. 
So there, it's a big project. It seems to have scheduled reserve, financial reserve, uh, and on, on schedule for a launch next autumn. Uh, I happen right now to just, just be rota rotating off the, uh, the council that oversees both the Hubble and the, uh, uh, the Webb telescope. So as of July 2nd, I will be reading about it just like everyone else. But right now, I know that what I told you is accurate. I think we have time for two more. My question has to do with the uh, measurement of the images. It, how do you get around the looks, what looks like the assembly that holds the secondary mirror? Does it block the light going to the primary mirror? Yeah, well, it's because it's a, uh, his question was, why don't you see a hole in the middle of the, the stars? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that's because you're not imaging that mirror, you're so imaging something way far away. So that if you looked at, uh, it's just in an optical system, that part disappears. I'm sorry, that's the only answer I can give right now. Okay. Uh, last question over here, the yellow shirt, please or the man in the yellow shirt. Oh. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, I certainly remember, and I'm sure everybody does, when it was announced that uh, Hubble was out of focus and you couldn't, the pictures were no good. The impression I was under, frankly, and it may be that I didn't read closely enough, was that somehow the astronauts had gone up and literally reground mirrors. Was it actually just a correction of an aiming point? They how was the correction done? It was not done by astronauts going up and touching the mirror, but rather taking advantage of the fact that each of the cameras, each of the instruments, has inside it some relay optics, several pieces of optics that form, take the image formed by the telescope and re-image it back say on the charge couple device. So it was just a question of putting in new instruments that in these relay optics had corrections in them for the shape of the uh, image it was receiving. Now for the instruments that were not cha changed out at the first servicing mission, what was done was to deploy a, uh, lenses that corrected for the shape of the, the mirror. Yeah, so it's exactly like this. The, these eyes focus, are supposed to be focusing the world back on your retina. So you just put in a prescription, uh, a prescription lens. And, but since then, that time, all of the instruments are new, and they all have this internal correction. So actually, the images, as of the first servicing mission, were just as good and slightly better than we ever anticipated they would be. And I'm out of voice, and Betsy's out of patience, and... Uh,